Demonology, like all aspects of religious mythology, shifts, alters, and transforms through history. As we've seen in my episode on Israelite demonology, the demonic population, as it were, of ancient Israel was surprisingly low compared to their neighboring civilizations in Mesopotamia and in Egypt. That would of course all change in the centuries following the Babylonian exile starting around 586 BCE with the rise of what scholars now call the apocalyptic mode of Judaism. The population of both angels and demons just ex positively exploded from the books of Enoch, the New Testament, and the sectarian scrolls found at Qumran the entire universe became filled with such metaphysical beings locked in combat, all of which would culminate in a final eschatological battle at the end of time. As the explosive magma of the apocalyptic cooled, so too did this intense and baroque attention paid to angels and demons. Early Christianity, while attesting to such beings, began the early process of systematically arranging their angelology and their demonology. That process, though, in rabbinical Judaism, on the other hand, was rather more complex. In this episode, I want to explore the demonology, as much as there is one demonology in rabbinic literature, specifically in the Talmud. While dozens of narratives concern demons, is there a systematic demonology to be found in the early rabbinic literature. How does geographic and cultural difference in this period have an impact on the development of demonological literature among the early rabbis? Let's explore the demonology of the Talmud. If you're interested in magic, hermetic philosophy, alchemy, Kabbalah, or the history of the occult, Make sure to subscribe and check out my other numerous content on topics in esotericism, including curated playlists. Also, if you want to support my work of providing accessible, scholarly, and free content on topics in esotericism here on YouTube for free, maybe you consider supporting my work on Patreon with a one-time donation or with the super thanks that you can find just below the video. Again, you can find those links below, and I really appreciate your consideration of supporting the channel and the project of making Esoterica widely available. But now, let's turn to the demons that haunt the complex, multi-layered pages of the Talmud. I'm Dr. Justin Sledge, and welcome to Esoterica, where we explore the arcane in history, philosophy, and religion. Before turning to the demons of the Talmud, it's first best to understand just what the Talmud is. Despite what you might have heard, the Talmud isn't, is not a commentary on the Hebrew Bible or the Christian Old Testament, though many of those certainly existed at that time. To understand it, we need to head back to the first century of the Common Era, following the Great Revolt of 66 to 73 of the Common Era, which is also basically a civil war in which Jewish forces fought to eject the Roman colonial presence from their homelands and also fight themselves for whatever reason, the subsequent destruction of the Jerusalem Temple in 70, and the Messianic insurrection led by Shimon Bar Kokhba, and of course the, the Roman genocides that followed all of this, the surviving Jewish religious establishment came to the very sober assessment that the very religion of Judaism was facing an existential crisis. They could just all be wiped out. The temple was destroyed, messianic expectations were completely smashed, aside from the Jesus movement, their expectations were still going good. Judaism was effectively banned in its own homeland. Roman pogroms killed entire Jewish population centers, and Jewish religious figures and leadership were being systematically hunted down and murdered. It sounds like regular old Jewish history. That's so grim. 
In the face of this titanic political and theological catastrophe, the surviving Jewish religious authorities, the rabbis basically being the only ones still, still standing, the rest had just been wiped out, they began the process of writing down what up to that point was only orally transmitted religious knowledge, including both the accepted practices and debates around the religious practices current to their day. Of course, while the Hebrew Bible and the Torah are filled filled with religious laws, the nature of their fulfillment is, is rather vague. Thus, when work is prohibited on the Sabbath, the natural question there might be, well, what is exactly constitutive of work? The debates and answers to those questions were taken to be the oral Torah, the Torah Shabbat Peh, an authoritative companion to the written Torah, equally bequeathed to Moses at Sinai, at least according to the rabbis who were putting it together and arguing for their own authority. The major work of writing, compiling, and editing this body of rabbinical wisdom is known as the Mishnah, itself a substantial series of volumes redacted sometime in the early third century of the Common Era. However, the Mishnah itself is both highly technical and terse, leaving still further questions unresolved. In the following centuries, rabbinical academies in both the Galilee and the Sasanian Empire over there in what is now Iraq, Iran, produced a further commentary on the Mishnah. These two commentaries form the basis of the Talmuds. Z. Talmuds, yes, Talmuds, plural. There are two of them. The Jerusalem Talmud composed earlier, around 400 of the Common Era, and the more standard, complete Babylonian Talmud redacted through the 7th century of the Common Era as well. The Mishnah, the two Talmuds, along with the Baraita and the Tosefta, these are both para-Mishnaic literature, and the legal or halakhic and legendary or agadic material form the nucleus of early rabbinical Judaism. Dozens of volumes, the nucleus here is. Now, given this literature alone will not give us a full picture of rabbinical thoughts on demonology, to shift back to the topic of the episode, for that, we would have to add the Jewish magical literature from the late classical world, some of which has been preserved in the Ibn Ezra synagogue, the Geniza there in Cairo, along with the corpus of Jewish incantation bowls meant for trapping demons and evil spirits, primarily produced in the Sasanian context over there in what is now Iraq around Pubedita and Sura, the main Jewish academies in that region. Now, I've covered a good bit of the early Jewish magical literature if you want to check out other episodes on that in the playlist in the card above. Of course, I'll also be coming back to fill out this picture by turning to those incantation bowls in a later episode. Those are so cool. They have little pictures of demons in them. Though, it should be noted that those bowls were ubiquitous across the religious spectrum with pagan, Mandean, Gnostic, Jewish, Christians, and kind of generic incantation bowls in a range of various degrees of literacy being produced and employed through that region. They weren't exclusively Jewish. They were kind of used by everybody because demon problems are everybody's problems. But turning to the Talmud, one final thing should be noted and constantly constantly recalled about Talmudic and rabbinical literature more generally. While logically arranged and systematically edited, the Mishnah and the Talmud do not, do not often represent definitive treatments of topics. This is very unlike systematic Christian literature, perhaps. Rather, they record hundreds of years of conversations and debates, debates, between rabbinical authorities holding a wide range of opinions. Thus, it's never really a good idea to say something like, well, the Talmud says, in some definitive final matter, because the Talmud is, again, a record of conversations and debates, many of which, most of which, are not finally authoritative in Judaism. In fact, Jewish law, or halakha, wasn't definitively encoded until the mid-16th century, a thousand years later after the Talmud in Joseph Karo's Shulchan Aruch, and honestly, that process is still very much ongoing to this day. So just because a rabbi declares this or that in the Talmud, and frankly and honestly, they can declare some pretty wacky, gross, even obscene, morally outrageous things, 
doesn't mean that that's the majority opinion, much less the definitive position of Judaism more generally. Unless you're an anti-Semite and like to take things out of context to make it look like Judaism is evil. Don't be that guy. In fact, the early rabbinical demonology is instructive on precisely this point. We have a debate, and much of the debate is between rabbis arguing about the nature and function and reality of demons, and we get a wide range of opinions. Now, to my knowledge, the Mishnah only contains one substantial mention of demons. There, in a rather late Mishnah, and almost as a kind of addendum, there is a famous list of things created by God on the eve of the first Sabbath, and included in that list are the mazikim. These literally mean the damagers, or the harmers. This idea was such that these beings were created in the haste leading up to the first Sabbath when work is forbidden, even by God somehow, and will later be used to explain why, one, they have no physical bodies, God kind of ran out of time making them, so they didn't get bodies, though there are actually debates in the Talmud about just how many shadows these beings cast, despite not having bodies, and two, their animosity towards human beings. They're jealous of us having bodies, so this is definitely not Gnostic. However, another text has Adam giving rise to what the text calls Ruchin Ushedim Uleilim, spirits, demons, and night demonesses during his 130 year long punishment for that whole, that whole Garden of Eden bit, though just how isn't clear, but it might be a form of masturbation. This is a form of demon production later also found in the Kabbalah in which unused seed semen becomes demons, semen demons. But neither of these two origin myths are definitive, as witnessed by how the two Talmuds deal with these beings in general. The Jerusalem Talmud, for instance, contains very little discussion on the nature of the demons and the tales about them. It's just not that interested in them. The Babylonian Talmud, however, is replete with dozens and dozens and dozens of such narratives. In fact, the Babylonian Talmud is even self-conscious of this fact, noting in some points that in the West, over there in the academies and the land of Israel, such interest doesn't seem to be, well, much of an interest over in Eretz Israel. In fact, much of the demonology of the Babylonian Talmud reflects the cultural exchange and syncretism of Jewish communities living in a larger Sasanian Persian context with the remains of ancient Near East mythology more generally. This is even noticed by the High Gaon a few centuries after the redaction of the Babylonian Talmud, such that he notes that the closer that one were to the center of gravity of Sasanian culture, the more one was prone to demonological speculation, and the further away, the less and less, hence there being little interest in such matters in Palestine. Though that isn't strictly speaking true, it's not even true really at all, because both Palestinian and Egyptian magical sources reveal a clear, educated interest in both angels and demons, but also interacting with them through magical means as seen by texts like the numerous amulets found in the Geniza of the Ibn Ezra synagogue, and even some of the earliest Western magic grimoires like the Sefer HaRazim and the Kharba de Moshe. Now, there's no way I'm going to get through every single demonological narrative from the Babylonian Talmud in this episode, and even again, if I could, that wouldn't represent some systematic treatment of Talmudic demonology. It's just nothing like a Talmudic demonology that's systematically there in the Talmud. But what can we generally glean? The Jerusalem Talmud notes that there are three such species of demons the Mazikin, the Shadim, and the Ruchot, though it doesn't exactly make it clear how these are different from one another. Perhaps it's worth noting that the Mazikin are the damagers, that final noon, by the way, Mazikin, tells us that grammatically we're in the world of Mishnaic Hebrew, not the classical Hebrew that you might expect, but these beings are typically associated with bathrooms, yep, bathrooms, ruins, and even a range of plants, especially date palms for whatever reason. In later Jewish folklore, they go on to become something 
imp-like, being more of a nuisance than a life or death threat the way they are in the Talmud. In fact, I, I call my kids maziks when they are acting out, but that, that might just be that might just be me. Shadim, as you may recall from my episode on Israelite demonology, were ancient Mesopotamian beings that underwent demonification in Israelite religion. And shade, shadim, the words here for these beings, became the standard word for demon in Hebrew. The most definitive statement we have about the shadim appears to, they quote, six statements were said regarding the shadim. In three ways they are like the ministering angels, in three ways they're like humans. A baraita, this is a text left out of the Mishnah but from the same time period, says, in three ways they're like the ministering angels. They have wings like the ministering angels, and they fly from one end of the earth to the other, and like other ministering angels, they know what will happen in the future. That is to say, they, they have some sense of what's going on in the time to come. And in three ways, they're like human beings. They eat, they drink like human beings, and they multiply like human beings, and they die. Apparently eating and drinking just counts as, as one there. But note that they die, which is interesting. That such demons know the future leads to the idea that inquiries can be made of them in this regard, but the rituals around asking demons about the future is carefully circumscribed, as you might imagine. In fact, there's a debate in the Talmud about when one can and cannot inquire of the demons, whether you can ask them on weekdays or Shabbat, and why. The ruling there is that generally such inquiries are forbidden because of the danger involved in asking demons about the future, though later codes actually modify this in sometimes surprisingly, even shocking ways. We even learned that a certain Rav Yitzchak Bar Yosef inquired of the Shadim and became magically trapped inside of a cedar tree that is only released through miraculous intervention. Yet a Baraita gives a clue as to how such inquiries could be made, apparently involving a ritual with an eggshell and oil. That also gives us the clue of why it was prohibited on the Sabbath. It was apparently some kind of fire-based scrying, using the oil and the egg to light a fire and look into the flames and see what the demons knew about the future. Though some demons were even on a first-name basis. As we know, demons named Joseph and Jonathan even lived and were known by certain rabbis. They even lived in their homes and ran errands for them in distant countries somehow. In fact, both the famed Rabbi Hillel and his student, Rabbi Yochanan ben Zakkai, could even speak the language of the Shadim. Indeed, the speech of demons is even considered in debates around counting as a witness in specific legal rulings, whether demonic voices could even count in legal rulings. They could be witnesses. Specifically, if a death has taken place in a remote place, the body had gone missing, thus trapping a woman to her dead husband, this is known as making a woman into an aguna. Though the rabbis are skeptical of demonic witnesses to make a court ruling. Ruchot simply means spirits and refers to any disembodied spirit, though has a connotation of those that haunt a specific area. Perhaps the most famous tales of such a being is to be found in Midrash Vayikra, a slightly later text in the Talmud, where a ruach haunts a well and the local villagers, led by the exorcist Abba Yossi of Zeitnor, drive it away by banging iron rods and tools. They might even kill it in that process. A spot of blood appears on the surface of the water as it either flees or dies. Remember that bit earlier about how the creatures here kind of die like people do? That might be an example of them beating a ghost to death. We learn that such beings are vast in number, being so numerous that if one could see them at all, that would be everything that you would see. Even the tattering of the clothes of scholars who only spend all day studying is caused by the crowding of this demonic friction. In fact, the Talmud includes a sort of magical concoction for seeing them using ashes of a black cat's afterbirth which, when rubbed into the eyes, will allow one to see the demons. You can see the shadim by rubbing this cat stuff in your eye. Though a certain Rabbi B.V. Bar Abaya did this and much harm came to him, so don't. 
A simpler procedure is simply detailed there also just involves sprinkling fine ashes around your bed before going to sleep and upon awakening you will allegedly see the footprints of the demons all around your bed appearing like chicken tracks. Yeah, in some texts they have feet like chickens. Further, in Tractate Chagiga, that doing things in pairs attracts demons, so we're told, thus the drinking of the four cups of wine during the Passover Seder has to be carefully interrupted, thus making it four individual cups and not two pairs of two really attract the demons. Though again, those in the West, i.e. in Eretz Israel, they don't seem to worry about this custom as the Talmud admits. Along with dwelling particularly in bathrooms, ruins, and vacant places more generally, demons are said to dwell primarily in the northerly areas of the earth and primarily in the airs above the earth. In addition, we have various demons like the migraine demon Palga, it's Aramaic for splitting, and Zereda, who dwells in the stumps of palm trees, the eyeless demon Rucha lives in uh, the caper bush, demon Wishpa dwells in the roots of trees, and the very fearsome demon Ketev Meriri is said to have been made of many peels, many hairs, and many eyes. It sees with one eye, and this eye is within its heart. And it has no power either in the sun or in the shade. Rather, its power is between the sun and the shade. It rolls around like a ball and has power from the fourth hour of the day until the ninth hour of the day. And more specifically, it has power from the 17th of Tammuz until the 9th of Av the major days of mourning in the Jewish calendar, and also whoever sees it falls over and dies. Like this demon, others seem to have power during certain periods of the day or night, certain places or certain times of the year. Other demons are specific to afflictions, like the demon I just mentioned, Palga, the splitting demon. There is a demon associated with epilepsy, with fever, with strong sexual desire, in a full range of illnesses, the blindness demon Shabriri, for instance, is dispatched by saying its name one letter at a time, diminishing it. And that's a bit like the abracadabra formula. You say its name and subtract one letter until it vanishes and it causes it to go away. This is all very much in keeping with, by the way, with the medical theories of the ancient Near East, especially in the Mesopotamian context, in which the major etiology for illness there was well, demons. Now, to deal with these demons, there's a range of techniques to be found in the Talmud, including a range of amulets, including the very powerful 60 demon amulet. Psalm 91 is also especially powerful. The literature even re relates how Moses, Moses recited it while ascending Mount Sinai to avoid the power of the demons that haunted that region. In fact, there's even tales about how once the Shekhinah came down to the earth, the demons were dispelled to a significant degree. There is no specified demonic hierarchy in the Talmud, though Samael and Asmodeus, or Ashmedai, a demon of Persian origin probably first appearing in the apocryphal book of Tobit, are sometimes offered as the king of the demons. He might also be associated with the Mashchit, or destroyer, the famed angel of death for whom being righteous or evil don't matter once the decree of death has been handed down. The famed demon Lilith makes an appearance, the famed demoness Lilith, sleeping in an empty house is said to attract her, so don't do that, and Ariman in the form of Hurmin, the Zoroastrian evil deity, is even called her son in Tractate Baba Batra. Though her famed origin story as the first wife of Adam, who refused normie missionary sex, actually occurs in the alphabet of Ben Serach, a text written a few centuries after the Talmudic period. Now, don't worry, I'm going to be coming back to Lilith in her own episode because she's fabulous. Though not as famous, the Queen of the Demons actually appears to be a certain Agrat, daughter of Machalat who previously stalked human beings with 180,000 Malachi Chabala, or Angels of Destruction. That is, until the famed miracle worker, Chanina Mendoza, restricted her to two nights a week. I'll let you find out which nights. You can 
go check out Tractate Pesachim 112b to learn those nights. And then Abaya further restricted her to uninhabited places, although in some texts Hanina does that too. Another demon queen will appear later is Naama. This is another alleged wife of Ashmedai or Asmodeus, who's actually going to feature very prominently later in Kabbalistic literature, especially in the Zohar. Needless to say, these are only some of the many narratives, tales, legends, opinions, and legal rulings found in the vast corpus of the Talmudic literature concerning demons. Simply put, at least in a Sasanian context, the existence of demons was taken for granted by the rabbinical elite of the period, with Emim appearing in a great many discussions over virtually every aspect of Jewish life, from legends to medicine to court filings. And yet, as we've seen, this is significantly different than in other Jewish contexts like those in the West, in Eretz Israel, at least at the literary level. The next generation of Jewish thinkers would introduce more straightforwardly philosophical analysis when regards to questions of demons, but they would mostly accept their reality, at least in some form, Maimonides, of course, being the only real exception there. But that's still a hell of an exception. Maimonides just didn't think demons existed at all. Of course, we'll also have to come back to the angelology and demonology of the Kabbalah in due time, and the Zohar, and boy, that's a, that's a wild, wild ride there, to be damn sure. I'm going to leave you some great sheets from the website Safaria in the description below if you want to look over some of the sources in Aramaic, Hebrew, and English in the Talmud itself. Just have fun with them. It's genuinely interesting material that, outside of an Orthodox Jewish context, basically never gets studied by non-Jews, which is a pity, because it's wonderfully weird and fun. They're stories about demons that most people have never even read before. Until next time, I'm Dr. Justin Sledge, and thanks for watching Esoterica, where we explore the arcane in history, philosophy, and religion.